So we're in the middle of an election, at the front end of the third week. And uh, you guys have got some wear and tear on you now. <laughs> we do. <laughs> Does it show? <laughs> <laughs> so can you do a quick description of what it's been like on the campaign trail during a pandemic? Sure. Um, <clears throat> a little bit of a different experience for me because I actually started out on the bus, which was which was a van. Um, so I, I'm a little bit behind, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but it's been uh, very edifying, very interesting, very different hmm. because of pandemic. I think hmm. we're trying to use as many resources as we can that keep people safe, that keep people, but engaged, yet engaged. So lots of phone calls, Lots of uh, backyard spaced out meetings with folks, um, that kind of thing. Certainly social media is playing a big part in, in mm. what, what I'm trying to accomplish here. So, yeah, it's been uh, very gratifying, too. Mm. Um, I think it's an honor to be able to run in, in uh, a democratic process like this. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, it is very exciting, uh, you know, using social media. Uh, standing by on the side of the road, waving to <laughs> yes. people. I mean, that, that is actually that's very humbling, but also uh, appreciate it very much. You know, you get to see the looks on people's faces mm. and the reactions that they're driving driving by. And you know, most of them are very, very, very positive. I like it when they honk, and that's uh, very rewarding. Mm. But uh, in this pandemic, yes, uh, you, the, not having the ability of knocking on doors, not having the ability of doing a lot of things that would normally take place. Uh, uh, because people are, are, are concerned and, uh, you know, because we're having an election in the, actually a really awkward time, mm. well, we're to, I know we're trying to make it as unawkward as possible. The only problem with you, you actually can't get to maybe all the people in the writing as you normally would. Sure, sure. Um, you two are rookies. What's that like uh, as a rookie, as a first timer? And, and what got you into it? Just a little bit of backstory sure. for people. Uh, you go first, Chris. Well, you know what, uh, Ricky, uh, I mean, I've been hanging around the political arena there a little bit on the outskirts, but uh, it, it's time to step up and uh, push the will of the people. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's exciting. It's exhilarating. Uh, to, sleep is much to be desired. I mean, yeah. that, that, that's something we can do probably in a couple weeks from now. Yeah. But uh, it is uh, very exciting because the people that you meet, you know, uh, kind of like as you're walking down the streets, yeah. uh, uh, it, it's actually quite quite exhilarating. People come out mm. to you and talk uh, with mm. about a bunch of issues, mm. everything from stoplights and speed limits to uh, you know yeah. low income housing. It yeah. just goes and goes. Yeah. But they're cut in just a bit. But what drives you? Oh, there's a passion. Oh, jump and listen. Uh, <laughs> listen. Way back when uh, my my father was in politics, you know, uh, uh, back minister back in the '60s, and growing up, I said, "There's no way in heck I was ever going to get into this." But as things unfold and you start to see how uh, how decisions are being made, and myself in the private sector, you say, "Well, there's time to have some influence from private sector within." So, oh, probably about eight or ten years ago, I started to hang around the political scene a little bit more and more all the time. And uh, there's a passion and then there's time. Uh, I'm very excited because all of a sudden it is, uh, it, it's in the blood. I don't know where this passion is really coming from except from upbringing and a passion making Brunswick stronger. Great, yeah. cool. Well, for me, um, <clears throat> I'm recently retired from about 30 years in, in the public service. Mm -hmm. So my experience comes from, <clears throat> excuse me, behind the scenes um, working with uh, uh, the two major political parties, obviously, the parties in power. Um, and that's given me a very interesting perspective, I think, on how the province is, is run. Um, I've seen, um, and, and this is going to be a little bit of inside baseball, but I think public servants will appreciate what, what I have to say. Over the past 30 years, there's been a, a definite shift and a concentration of power to the centre. And the voice of cabinet is not as strong as it once was. And I, I'd like to be a part of a cabinet that actually works together and that works with the public service and, and to kind of re-energize that. To me, that's hugely, hugely important. The public service is often blamed when things go badly, but they're never supported when things go very well. And I think we have a very capable public service and, and as evidence, the way this province has handled COVID-19 
it's public servants who are driving that, you know, um, and, 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 and as well, the, the, um, the cabinet committee on COVID. I mean, this has been a collaborative effort. Dr. Jennifer Russell is a public servant and she does okay. a fantastic job. And it's individual New Brunswickers too, who have stepped up and, mm -hmm. and done that. So that's part of my reasoning. Um, I think to bring back some of that thought in government in terms of policy making policy on the fly has been happening for too many years and and it's to detrimental effects um mm -hmm. so to me that's hugely important it's a little bit boring as a campaign item but there are other <laughs> things that i want to talk <laughs> yeah. about too yeah but but this is thanks for wondering into that because when interviewing some of the other guests on the political um, side of things i like wondering in the process as opposed to all the concrete outcomes or all the yes, targets, because yeah. the process is what's going to get you to those targets. Yeah. Yeah. So the four-way minority for um, two years, and you could kind of see some of it eroding because of people's frustrations the past 30 years, yes, like you speak, yes. with their concentration of power, and then it's pushed the agenda through, as opposed to how can you help make this agenda better. Right. Um, but there's a lot of people um, will be sitting, well, we've got an election during a pandemic when school's starting. It's like, why are they doing this yes. now? Yes. Which goes back to that desire um, from the two traditional parties, which you guys wear now, to be in power so that we can push our agenda through. Yeah. So are, is there a softening for how um, this approach could happen or do we want to go back to the way it was for 30 years? Well, I, I, I will take a little bit of issue about you, you saying the two political parties are pushing this. Th this election is about Blaine Higgs. Okay. Period. <laughs> Take the words out okay. of my mouth. Yeah. So, okay, because because yeah. some of the yeah. stories I've been told is it was the liberal bunch that walked out of the room first, but there um, might have been reasons for that, or everybody's going to have their own version of that. I, the, the liberal party took a very firm stance against um, the conservatives trying essentially to have a majority without a mandate. It's right. unheard of absolutely unheard of so and and that's just not on so we are here because of blaine higgs okay. nicole no thank question. you for saying that because you know what <laughs> we're, we're on the same team and and yes i mean these are the words that we really want to say and stress because this is the reality there's only one person that could call this election mm -hmm. only one and uh he uh, blaine did call this election in absolutely the worst time and a very stressful time when people are actually going to school I mean, there, there's health issues, planning. I mean, it, it is the worst time that this could happen. Uh, and uh, just pushing it a little further, uh, and I got to give uh, Kevin Vickers credit that they, they weren't going to, even if they won the, the, uh, a couple of by-elections that are supposed to be coming up, mm -hmm. they weren't going to bring down the budget, I mean, bring, bring the government down. Uh, they wanted to see the budget that would come out in March. And that buys us eight months of after school being in, after everything yes. settled yeah. out, yeah. and right. after possibly a second wave. So yeah. it, it's about time and respect. That's very much yeah. consistent with um, with purple and green in that we didn't need to have an election now. No. It's got the same tones to it. You all got there a different way, but yeah. you're all saying yeah. kind of the same thing, which is interesting for the public to know and to understand. Right. Um, so in behind the process thing, and um, but being rookie candidates, but you were probably uh, observing closely and have an intimacy with it. Um, what was your take on that four-way minority exercise? Because voters, there's going to be the range of issues, but then there's going to be the process. So do voters want to put you back in a four-way minority situation again? Or do they want to go back to someone's in charge? Because that's part of what's happening on the street, because it, it cracked open a little bit two yeah. years ago. Yeah. We did something yeah. we haven't done for 100 years. Yeah. Um, so that has to be part of this narrative. So what's that like for you two? Well, for, for sorry, did you oh, want no, me to no, you have to, have to after you. You might have to edit that a little yeah. bit. It's all good. <laughs> it's real. I'll, I'll take a beat. Uh, I think around that, that question, there's no question that, that New Brunswickers want to see more collaboration. And I think that is to the point about hearing more voices and listening to more voices. I think that's completely accurate. Um, what I struggle with is when, you know, one would expect that if you are in a minority situation, if you have some allegiances and alliances, so to speak, that it would be benefit somebody, not just the sitting part, not just the, the big guys, so to speak. When I look at Fredericton South, um, Mr. Kuhn had an opportunity to do things, to use his balance of power to get things moving. <laughs> not seeing too much happening so 
you know, it, it, yes, we need to be cooperative and, and here. And I, I do truly believe that the legislature can, can be better at doing that. And I also believe that, um, you know, the, the Cabinet Committee on COVID is an example yeah. where, you know, there's input. Um, and the province came out well in terms of that. But we do live in a, in, a, in a particular system and we have to work within that system. But yes, I, I fully agree we need to hear more voices. Um, but I, I do feel strongly that um, in, in this particular minority situation, you know, it's great that, that uh, the Alliance got their license plate deal. Wow, that's done a whole lot for the province. Um, but seriously, um, let's let's talk about the, the bigger issues and the things that really need to, to change. Hmm. So like myself, a good idea is a good idea. It doesn't matter where it comes from. And to have people of different parties and people collaborating, collaborating working together is what government and cabinet should be all about uh you know it, 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 setting the stripes down we're actually here to work for the people and pull the people's passions and wishes forward and debate and and to have a real good solid discussion to get a results for our region our province uh, because if we don't do that, we're just spinning and wasting everybody's time. And a bad idea that can be brought forward that has some aspects of good, we can pull those aspects of good and move those things forward. So discussions, real constructive yeah. discussion goes a very long ways. Mm -hmm. So actually, uh, the, I watched it with the, the, the covert virus virus group coming together that was wonderful i mean under the lead of dr jennifer russell was fantastic that's that's the way it should be mm -hmm. um even if there's a particular party in power working together mm -hmm. uh, is what we should be doing you two are hinting around the edges in a way but and gently and that's good um on where the influence is and the influencers are so one of the things that um, opened up with having a minority government was another narrative about the the backroom people who truly make the decisions in the province mm -hmm. having their fingers in you know the two traditional parties it's, mm -hmm. it's always framed in the media um, and with having a four-way minority government one of the narratives is it takes some of that influence and power away from those that aren't elected yeah. um, how do you guys handle that narrative when you're on the street say so the street version would be, oh, you guys get back in power right back to where we were 30 years ago. And the unelected people are the ones telling you what to do. Right. Can I take you I, I mean, you, you have this all the time. <laughs> eh? And so I want to surface it so yeah. people hear yeah. um, w where the nuances are. Well, you know what? Uh, uh, talking to quite a few people, it's uh, uh, it's pulling other people, uh, other platforms together that reflect yeah. the ideas of the populace of just what we need to do yeah but uh, but the ones that are in behind the scenes saying that's nice but we're still spraying glyphosate or or we're still doing this or we're still pushing pipelines because that's how it shows up on the street with a concrete item and yeah. i want to wheedle away and give you the space that in the back room no it actually works this way but with being rookie, rookies is like a little unfair we can nail steven with that later because he's been in the <laughs> middle of that stuff right but and, and it's part of the dynamic and i'm, yeah. I'm just trying to surface it uh, so I, people I, can have confidence or faith that it's yeah. being done in people's best interest so i, I if if i might oh, yeah, yeah. Chris, um uh, there are some pretty hot issues that yeah. have come up and and i'll take clinic 554 for example in mm -hmm. fredericton south um, <clears throat> it is a private clinic where where women's reproductive rights are very much supported and helped. Oh, yes. Costs money though for an individual to go there. It's also a clinic that that supports the LGBTQ community in in a very significant way. So here are marginalized people um, who do not have equitable access to healthcare. That is wrong. Mm -hmm. In 2020 in Canada, it's just wrong. Mm -hmm. Our leader, Kevin Vickers, um, has taken a very, very strong stand on that. And I had a conversation with, with the, the party back people yeah. <laughs> to yeah. say, yeah. I, need, I feel very strongly about this myself. Yeah. What does the old guard think? Yeah. I said, what does the old guard think? And, and the leader basically said, we're doing this. <laughs> it's the right thing to do. Good. So there were a few issues like that. Same thing with glyphosate. Yeah. Um, the phones were ringing off the hook from certain people. I can assure you of that. And uh, the leader has been very clear. 
in, in, yeah. uh, in my nomination yeah. speech, that was one of the things that I actually have is that is that reopening the conversations of uh, glyphosates. And uh, and uh, uh, Kevin Vickers took that and made that part of the platform. So it's very nice that uh, uh, that we as candidates have brought issues to the table and they're actually being listened to yep. and taken seriously. So, I mean, this is this is something that's a big deal that I find is the communications and the openness to listen and to run and also discuss what are the repercussions going to be. So very proud of what's taking place on that front because I would, uh, uh, because when I brought that out in my nomination speech, um, it was looked at really hard. And I did not, uh, you know, uh, after the speech came out, uh, they said that was a, a good idea. We can start to work with this. Okay. So thanks for wandering into that. So to keep wandering, <laughs> um, the, you guys weren't there, but Mr. Horseman was. The... Uh, so people out there were going to be watching this going, yeah, but you guys voted the bill down when it was introduced in the legislature. So it's a slightly unfair question because it wasn't you guys involved. But in terms of your party and during an election period, guaranteed on the door, someone's going to go, yeah, but the liberals voted with the conservatives on the green bill about banning glyphosate. Um, so can you speak to that space a little bit? And to add in there and on social media, I mean, there's a bunch of experts that give good content on social media, and then you yeah, got to filter yeah. out the, the other yeah. element. Um, but someone made a good point about um, it was what was it? DDT was the first one, and then it went to uh, another another oh, chemical for the budworm yeah. city stuff, and then so we've gone through three or four different chemicals that have been used to spray. And the fear was that we're going to ban glyphosate and then there'll be the new chemical come up and we're just on this treadmill rather than getting at the root of how do we protect um, our environment. So can you speak to, um, you know, the past uh, performance in the legislature, recent performance, and then how that'll be different if you're the ones making the motion to ban glyphosate? And then is this just one step in a continuum that we've done for 40 or 50 years using New Brunswick as an experiment and we're spraying these chemicals around and long-term consequences don't show until 30, 40 years later? You know well, let me just uh, add to that a little bit. Uh, so no, not being part of that discussion prior to, and yeah. that, would, that, that would be uh, rude, but moving, as, I hate the word moving forward, but yeah. here we go. But it's okay, because <laughs> you're going to run into that yeah. in the next two weeks. Uh, you know what, I mean, I'd rather have warm bodies working in the woods versus coal chemicals. Yeah. Okay, this, this is me coming out and pushing this one forward. And it is different times. And, uh, you know, with the global warming and all the other issues that, that, that are spawning from this, we have to take a stronger stance on our environment. And, uh, you know, I mean, we have to start looking harder at the birds and the bees, the, the flowers and the trees. If we don't start taking care of those, yeah. they won't take care of us. Yeah. But So it is moving towards a different time. And everything takes time. There is a shift. And as the people speak, us as politicians, we need to listen. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, this is a, a part of the platform that uh, I'm very proud of, and uh, that, that's what I've got to say. But just to cut in a bit, our New Brunswick Civil Culture Program 20 years ago used to be awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. Awesome. And, and exactly. it's going chop, 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 chop. Yes, and, yes. And to, and to give some space and grace, um, public are a fascinating beast. You guys can't say it, but I might be able to get yeah. it. Sometimes they don't know what they want. Yeah. So they'll be looking for lower budgets or more cost efficiency. So we're going to cut the silver culture program. So the government's getting what they want. But 20 years later, you got this other thing going on. Yeah, having having worked in the Department of Finance on budgets, at, I saw that number. I think it was like way up around 20 million and every year it would just chop. get chop, 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 yep. so to speak. Um, but back to your point about what happened in the legislature. Hmm. That's done. Okay. <laughs> That's done. That is done. That's I like done. That. Everything's done. Okay. The, it's we're, we're entering, as you say, it's a whole new ball game right now. So that's over. Everything that was on the order paper is gone. New faces, new, new ideas. New faces, new forward. ideas. Okay. Um, and, and I truly believe that, that that's an interesting part of our system, yes. too, right? Yeah. You, 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 you clean the slate and you start over. Yeah. So this is an opportunity to start over. And I think, as, as again, you know, I... I'm proud that we're the Liberal Party, and, and it is a mainstream party. I've, I feel no shame about that yeah, whatsoever. Yeah. But to say, you know, here's a mainstream party taking some pretty strong oh. stances on issues that are interesting. <laughs> I'm smiling because I'm thinking, oh, the Liberals are going back to being Liberal again. <laughs> <laughs> because for 30 years, you had, you know, all blue and, green, or blue and red, it's the same, right? Um, 
So Mr. Hatfield was the most liberal premier we had, right. and Frank and McKenna was, was the, the most, most conservative. conservative. That kind of <laughs> mess. So, so maybe, you know, it's 30 years later, maybe the cycle has worked its way through, and you guys can go back to your roots yeah. a little bit. And that gives the voters some clarity I, about who should be doing the job in what window of time, because we're in a certain yeah, window of yeah. time right now. I think there's a clear distinction, and it's, yeah. it's becoming clearer that, you know, conservative means conservative we're just going to keep things the same that's right conserve mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the liberal party <clears throat> i think has done a very good job under kevin vickers of, of really um opening up the tent being more inclusive he is a man who uh engages terrifically with people oh, yeah. and and wants to bring people in we we have um some very interesting and diverse candidates as as part of our team, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. It's just wonderful. Um, so yeah, I I think you are seeing a distinction. The the, the the Higgs government is all about Mr. Higgs, and it and it's about austerity. Um, you see that in signs. I think he's behind every one of them. It's, the, kind, of, it's kind of creepy. <laughs> do you remember when Marshall Button used to yeah. do his Lucien gig? Yeah. And, oh, and, yes. And Camille yeah. Terrio was uh, <laughs> the premier at the time. And that was one of the first times they stuck, the graphic artist stuck Camille's face on everybody. And Marshall had fun making a joke about why does that person in front have that look on their face? <laughs> <laughs> what I like the diversity of the people that are stepping up. And, yeah. uh, and we're all working together from different aspects of different life uh let's say i'm from business and technology yeah. you come government background yeah uh, yeah and we have do uh, doctors that are stepping up we've got to, we get the first nations that have stepped up They're from all walks of life i mean that and to, to, to make the list is huge and we're all looking out for the best interest of the province so together as a team with different perspectives yeah. is a big deal yeah. Yeah. um we have probably 15 minutes or so um, I want to turn it over to you guys. Say, what are the key points that you want to make sure people hear um, while you're here? Because social media is great that way for getting yeah. out your key points. So. Well, a couple things that I would like to oh, start yeah. out with. I love interviewing with you because I don't have to say a whole lot. So this, yeah. this is it's great. different oh, with two you, people. Are yeah. you saying that I talk no, too actually, much? No, actually, I'm saying that, you know what? That's you're saying funny. a lot of the words. <laughs> you're saying a lot of the things that, well, you know what? Oh, I don't have to say it because you're saying yeah. it. It's just fantastic. <laughs> well, see, we're aligned. There. Yeah. <laughs> that was easy, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so here, uh, I mean, come from the IT background and... Uh, just like back in the, I hate to say it, the 1900s, when phone lines and power was being brought out but, into people's homes. But but don't don't hesitate because that's a valid point. There's all kinds of studies that are showing that the moment in time we're living in now, yeah. from roughly 2010 to 2030, is a huge transformation happening, yeah. equal to 1910 to 1930 or so. Yeah. Or despite the even with the finances weaving in a yeah. certain way, it does. So it's going to take a different approach because we're entering a transitional phase. So it fits perfectly what you're saying. Well, yes, I'm pulling into rural Internet. I mean, I live in a part of rural New Brunswick and my Internet is uh, my Internet service provider is absolutely fantastic with what's available. You know, I mean, I'm, my Internet comes in through directional antennas mm -hmm. um, and it's pretty good good but it's nowhere good enough to really run a good solid business or great zoom meetings education yep. i mean it's a it's a different time so going from the same you know bringing the phone lines to people's homes to power to people's homes and that was literally less than a hundred years ago yep. and today is communication technology so um, if we have to do homeschooling or days at home um internet's Board, dial up, it drops out. You don't get the same qualities internet of inter I mean of communication education yeah. as you would if you're in town. And the costs actually are fairly steep. The further out you go, the price goes up. Sure. So isn't it interesting that that one of the main drivers for a local business would be access to high speed internet. Mm -hmm. And yes. now because of population densities different places, you're seeing all kinds of five G commercials kick out now. Yeah. So it's gonna leave us even further behind in order to help the rural economy get its up wheels up and running. Um, so this comes up all the time. So I wanna compare it to Enbridge when Enbridge first came to the province and there's a whole subsidy program to help them get a foothold yeah. into certain markets, whether it's industrial or residential. Does the same pattern unfold, or could the same pattern unfold for, well, for... I would like to see something like that, and this is still up for discussion, because, uh, uh, but, but in technology, 
I feel just like the the phones coming to homes, safety, communication. Like mm-hmm. you can't dial nine one one if you don't have cell phone signal, yep. and if you don't have a landline. And there's places in this province that still right. do not have this. Mm-hmm. If the phone line goes down because a power a, a power line or or a tree gets knocked knocked into the lines, you're done, yep. and you have to go up to the top of the nearest hill, uh, like through the storm Arthur. Uh, that that was an issue. Yep. So yes. It so, could, so what's your plan for, for what do you vision like within a liberal government for the next four years? What would be the goal? Well, I have to push towards my goal is to have reasonably and decent high speed internet to everybody in rural New Brunswick, so they have the same opportunities as people in town, uh, the people that are, are are in the you know the, the the center parts of the province, because where do our where does our food come from? farmers they need communications mm-hmm. you know i mean there's technology and gps technology that has to be out there to help run a lot of different equipment uh, so i'm going to be pushing very hard for that because we need this in today's economy mm-hmm. and education very much so great so that's that's where i'm at so no, i'm pushing hard for this no but that's great thank you thank you so um a, a particular issue for me that that's important to Fredericton South is absolutely the question of homelessness, and, and I think that that's something that absolutely mind. needs to be addressed. Um, it's appalling to me that, you know, a prosperous city like Fredericton hasn't seemed to be able to find the way to, to help and to fix that. Um, it, it is a big issue. I, I get that. Um, but I think we do have the tools are there. I think the tools are absolutely there in terms of, of what this, the city can provide, what the province can provide, what the federal government can, can provide. So let's just pick up the tools and get at it. Okay. Um, there are, I think, some root cause issues that we have to work towards to, to solving in terms of homelessness. And, and obviously that, that would be some mental health issues mm. um, that are often exacerbated <laughs> by addiction issues. Mm-hmm. I think we need to talk about the care of the whole person I think we need to bring the services directly <coughs> to those folks where they are. I mean, I'm privileged. I and and I don't have an issue with homelessness. Um, I my husband has suffered from mental health issues, and and we were privileged again because we are part of the system. So we had access to things, and and thankfully that's going great. But but those folks who are marginalized don't have that access. So we need to bring those services to them, and I think we can do it. And I think we need to talk about harm reduction, in in <coughs> why we're doing those things, especially around the addictions piece. So there's some great folks in Fredericton already working hard on that, yeah. and I think we need to really support them, mm-hmm. and 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 help landlords help landlords to yeah. pro- be able to provide. Um, shelter for and homes for people to, to me it's just a basic human right so that that's a big one for me the low income housing is a big deal and that oh, was brought yeah. up in that uh, uh and uh, issues in, up in uh, Fredericton West Hanwell opening up those doors yeah, and uh absolutely. helping helping landlords create those opportunities yep um that ties to I want to weave it together because this is fun thank you um, oh, yeah, thank because, you because it gets to the interconnectedness of things. Yes. And so when you focus on a project like homelessness, so as soon as you said the homelessness stuff and we have to help, I'm thinking, yeah. And then there's uh, Senator Ermine Cohen's study back in the 1980s. Yes. And we're almost saying the same thing yes. 40 years later. Yes. So I want to ask, it's a process problem where we get stuck, which gets into the election cycle, driving yeah. long-term strategies. Yeah. When I had Randy Hatfield on from yeah. the Human Development yes. Council, he's talking about, oh, yeah. new government, i got to go back to filling yeah. up the forms and, differently. And Randy does <laughs> you know? amazing work. You know? Yeah, he really does. So yeah. all of that, thinking, okay, so it's a systemic problem. So where do the breakthroughs occur? Because we do have all the resources. We've got the knowledge. We've got, <laughs> we've got everything. We just don't put it together well. And sometimes the jam is at a political level because of the rotation or yeah. election cycles. So we will do this, we will do that. Or is it that a, um, a civil service that's constantly in the same treadmill and they got to change? We used to have a wellness branch, which is now gone. Mm-hmm. Um, those sorts of things. So are there some topics or themes that can go beyond an election cycle that somehow can get instituted? And where I wanted to slide, because it connects both of you, is municipal reform. 
I mean, we have 350 some odd governing structures in a oh, province of yes, 750,000 people, you know. Yeah. So uh, yeah. <laughs> is that a place where things get stuck? Because the city will say, well, homelessness is the province's mm-hmm. problem. And, and that thing will bounce back and forth. Yeah. Can you play in that space? Well, actually, much? probably the best person to answer that stuff would be Stephen Horseman because okay. uh, he was the minister <laughs> of. Okay. Yeah. So, so we'll ding him with yeah. that when, when it's. But you trend. know what? I think that I think that would be respectfully to because that that would be part of okay. uh, uh, Stephen's plan. Uh, municipal reform. But yeah. I, I I can throw something in there too, having worked in in the Department of Finance and I was responsible for the Municipal Finance Corporation, so I have a bit of an understanding <laughs> of where the money goes yeah. and how it all works. Yeah. Um, I also. Uh, uh, I had the pleasure of working in Sean Graham's office uh, when the Finn report was done. Mm-hmm. That is a uh, a seminal document. It is it is actually um, yes. brilliant. Yes, you'd be crazy to take it all on, uh, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think I mean it's <laughs> it's it's huge. Just to consolidate, right? But but I think that that we. Again, a lot of really wonderful work has been done, and we need to let the public service run with those things. Mm-hmm. That That's what needs to happen, and, and we have to have the courage to do it. And and I, I truly believe I see that in Kevin Vickers. There's another issue, too, that... Um, that, that relates to the marginalized people that I, I would just like to raise as being important to me. And, and that is our Aboriginal communities mm-hmm. and, and the, the, um, the, the absolute need for uh, an inquiry into systemic racism in, in the province of New Brunswick. That's on my list right yeah. here. No, yeah. It's, uh, you know, that's just something, it, it's, yes. t- to me, again, it's another one that, that touches me, me personally because I had the opportunity to work with Aboriginal communities in the past. So... Um, Again, you know, opening the the tent and and, and the, the the discourse to more voices yep. and bringing them in. It's really important in this moment of time. Like I yeah, agree with absolutely. you. From all the uh, homework I've done and the pleasure of doing the show and all the different yeah. guests who come and offer their brains yeah. and their hearts and stuff. Yeah. It's it, when Ron Tremblay was on the show yeah. and um, Greg Nicholas and Tim Hogan and yeah. Brandon Mitchell and it, we can speak to where their world is and where they're at, but they also speak very much to, we need to be part of the bigger picture now, which means systems need to shift. Uh, I had fun taking Mr. Poitras to task a little bit after the last election with um, him saying that that everything was a mess in the legislature. And I'm thinking, no, it's an opportunity here. Um, And so I had chess pieces and dots and stuff and because that's all I had techni- technically and said, and here's the king, which is, you know, the queen's representative. Sort, and you bring in First Nations and you almost have a circle yeah. in your decision making process. Yeah. So it sounds like there's some opportunity oh, yeah. for that to emerge now. I think well, so. New, well, New Brunswick, I mean, uh, uh, you know, we, let me start again here. It's well, a, you know what? It's um, uh, when. When the the First Nations were starting to ask for an inquiry systemic racism in our judicial systems, mm-hmm. um, I've got to give really take Stuart compliments for standing up to say yes, we should do this. Mm-hmm. Um, and then now he's not with the influence of Blaine Higgs and Dominic Cardi pushing that downwards. I'm I, I've gone to Kingsclear First Nations, mm-hmm. and I've talked to a few people on the street and. Uh, uh, we're we're the party that's going to bring that forward, and we have to. I mean, you know, we lost. You know, I mean, uh, very unfortunately, you know, uh, Rodney Rodney Levi and Chantel Moore. Uh, but but this is not just a new thing. This has been going on for a very long time, and it's we need to document this stuff because if we don't document it, it will not be addressed. We'll pass it on. Why can't New Brunswick be a leader in this? Yes, mm. they'll say it's a federal issue, but why can't? Yeah. But we have a local issue. Let's bring this forward. So yeah. I actually get chills when I talk about this because it has to happen. Because if I was in that position, and uh, you know we've had a situation, I want to be heard. I want to be seen, and it's all about respect. Yeah. If our First Nations brothers and sisters, and and I might be bold in saying that, but but I believe this very much so. If we don't work together. The healing will not continue. Mm. I am, I'm fighting for this. Mm. It also ties to other themes from other guests too. That um, because we're in a transitional and transformative time, yeah. there's an awful lot of the core values within Indigenous culture that are going to actually lead us 
out of where we are Absolutely. to where this we need to go. This is amazing stuff. But it's going to make for some interesting times when it comes to mining, because Herb Emery wants to, you know, mine the province, and RPC, <laughs> RPC <laughs> has, RPC has their map out there with, uh, here's all the mining opportunities in province, and forty billion dollars left on the table from investment. That's a culture and a mindset and a narrative, which kind of bangs real hard against. We mm -hmm. have to protect land, protect water. Because that vision has a hundred year vision and you know, this vision has more of a return Short on return, investment yeah. vision. So that's the space we're walking into, like it or not, the next 20 years. Right. Well, so we got to find a nice way to make that still be community. But you know what? Let's not forget about down at Mount Pleasant Mines. Uh, you know, that has been abandoned, an old Malignum mine that is still there. The structure is still there, mm. but it's been abandoned for 30, 40 years now and it's a it's a it's a space so we mustn't forget what the repercussions are if there's no cleanup and thing you know we have to respect our environment because there's a spot in the province that when you drive through you know rural New Brunswick you say oh my goodness where am I what's going on here absolutely nothing except old buildings derelict where there's a mining facility that has just left uh, so I don't want to ever see that happen in this province ever again. Yeah, that's yeah. Okay, so let's do a little bit of a wrap up. Yeah. Um, maybe two minutes each for what you want to say, and that'll be what I edit as your soundbite. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the pressure's on. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. But well, but we got to wrap up and get Mr. Horseman in here. And, yeah. and uh, so, how do you want to end? Well, may I? Go ahead. Well, hi. I'm the Liberal candidate for Frederick and West Hanwell. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Uh, uh, really, feel free to reach out to me at any time yeah. on Facebook or email or phone call. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the, the numbers are all on the website, duffy.ca. Yeah. Uh, but feel free to reach out. I want to hear from you because there's other issues out there in the writing that I'm not familiar with yet uh, because I may not be your neighbor, but I am your neighbor. Uh, reach out. We're definitely there. Uh, very proud to be the candidate for uh, the Liberal Party in this region because I, I feel it really reflects my position in life and what I and I've got a leader that uh, that, that is listening, mm -hmm. which I am very proud of. So my name is Chris Duffy. I hope I can earn your vote. <laughs> there you go. Well done. Well done. Uh, I, I just like to conclude by thanking you, Dennis, for the opportunity to have this conversation. Yes. I have found it extremely interesting. Quite it's frankly. different. Eh? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's wonderful. Um, and as well, uh, yes, I'm very proud to be representing the Liberal Party in Fredericton South. Um, I would encourage uh, everyone to reach out to me as well. You can reach me through Facebook or nbla.ca is where my... Uh, there's a lot of information there, yeah. and, and I would encourage people to do so. Um, this is an important election. It's it's unfortunate that it was called at this time, yes. but it's a very meaningful election. So, and, and another thing, I encourage people to vote. Please get out and vote. Do it Please. safely. There are opportunities to do that. You can go to your returning office, any returning office, anywhere, any day, and vote. Get out there and vote. Um, and that's my little Nicole. pitch. <laughs> Nicole, Great. pleasure having this interview with you. And you Dennis, too. Thank you very you much. Too. This thanks, has actually Chris. been very fun. fun eh? <laughs> Good, thanks, because we, thank we wandered into some awkward spaces, but there's room, and then you got to, to run a little bit. With thank it. you. And, Appreciate it. And, you know, we could go two hours, right? We, we probably barely, could. We're barely we get on the road. <laughs>